Um, I am really excited to be here to talk to you about um, some of my work that looks at how the brain and uh, supports memory. Um, so not surprisingly from the title of my talk and also from that lovely introduction, I'm going to be focusing quite heavily on how the hippocampus supports both the way we remember but also the way we use information that we remember. Okay, so just to orient, orient you, the hippocampus is located deep within the middle part of the brain in the medial temporal lobes. Um, so it's actually shaped a bit like a seahorse, and a fun fact is um, uh, hippocampus is seahorse in Latin. Um, and there's now decades worth of both neuroimaging and also neuropsychological evidence that really began with some of the seminal work that was done here in Montreal on patient HM by Brenda Milner, um, who actually, Morris Moscovich, did uh, some work with as well. Um, and this work really shows that the hippocampus is essential for episodic memory. So this is our memory for information from a specific time and place, or being able to remember a specific episode and associated cont contextual details. Okay, so in a uh, way, okay. So in thinking about how the hippocampus supports episodic memory, there's going to be three main points I'd like to make in this talk. So first I'm going to show you that the hippocampus is actually made up of different functional zones or subregions that are recruited differently depending on uh, what information is retrieved. So the second point is that while traditionally the hippocampus is thought of this region that's really exclusive to memory, um, what I'm going to show you is that these processes can also be used, ta used for tasks that don't necessarily involve remembering. So this is going to highlight the functions of what we think of as memory processes outside the domain of remembering. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you about how memory processes are actually recruited differently across individuals. So here I'll present some data on um, findings that individual differences in approaches to remembering um, have uh, a neural basis. Now, to get a good understanding of episodic memory processes, I think a really good way is to um, um, focus on or think about autobiographical memories. So this is our ability to recall specific past personal experiences. So episodic memory is a really important aspect of, of autobiographical memory, but it's not the only mnemonic component. Um, so research often talks about two sort of memory systems that contribute to autobiographical memory. So we have this semantic component, which includes remembering general knowledge and facts. So recovering facts, let's say, about ourselves, uh, about our goals, and maybe uh, concepts related to that experience you're remembering. And then we also have this episodic memory component. Um, and again, this is your ability to recall very specific details uh, from events that you're remembering from your past. And episodic memory is really the defining feature of autobiographical memory because our ability to recall these very specific details is what allows us to really richly re-experience uh, past events. And as, uh, as we know, the hippocampus is really important for supporting this aspect of autobiographical recall. Okay, so the question really is then, um, if the hippocampus supports episodic uh, memory, how does the hippocampus allow us to recall these specific details from our past events? So uh, the predominant view is that when we remember, what happens is that the hippocampus actually constructs that memory in a very flexible way. So how this works is that the hippocampus is actually the hub of a larger neural network that includes other brain regions. And these other brain regions are going to hold uh, different aspects or different details of an event you're remembering. So then when you retrieve an event, the hippocampus actually constructs or builds that memory by kind of pulling these details from other cortical areas. And the hippocampus can actually do this or pull these details in a flexible way, which means that it can actually construct memories in different ways. So this brings uh, us to the first point of the talk. And here I'm going to show you that there's different ways of constructing a memory actually relies on uh, different regions of the hippocampus. So this idea is actually based on um, this notion of a functional specialization within the hippocampus, particularly along the long axis. 
So what I mean by this is that there's processing differences between the anterior and posterior regions of the hippocampus. So we actually have a lot of evi uh, evidence from both uh, animal models and also neuroimaging, uh, neuroimaging studies to show that this is the case, that the anterior and posterior hippocampus might function differently. But we still really don't know how these regions are supporting, supporting particular aspects of remembering. OK, so the view I'm going to talk about um, suggests that the anterior and the posterior hippocampus contribute to memory differently depending on the scale that a memory is constructed on. So I can say this another way is uh, these two regions, the anterior posterior hippocampus, are going to be recruited depending, let's say, on the level of information of an experience that you're extracting. Um, so specifically, when, let's say, you're accessing a memory and you're recalling more of the conceptual details or more broad level uh, pieces of information, so you're thinking, let's say, about the gist, um, you're going to recruit anterior aspects of the hippocampus. But if a memory is recalled, let's say, by recalling more, uh, recalling this event on a more fine grain scale, so if you're recalling more perceptual or spatial details, like remembering the context or in the environment an event occurred in, then retrieval is going to be supported by the posterior hippocampus. OK, so I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that uh, provided evidence for this view. So I'll first talk about, about a behavioral study, and then I'll talk about a neuroimaging study. Um, but this behavioral study, I think, is important because it uh, shows us that accessing memories in these two ways can actually be dissociated at this level. Um, so how would we do this? So how would we see if you know these accessing memories at different scales are going to be um, are going to be retrieved differently? Um, so the way that we, that we did this in this study is we actually used two cues to trigger remembering. So first we had what I'm going to call these thematic or theme cues. So examples here are accomplishments, social outings, uh, traveling, and so forth. So with these cues, when people are using them to remember, they're going to remember more uh, on a global or a conceptual scale because these uh, thematic cues are getting you to access information from uh, this more just broad level uh, representation. We also had uh, used these spatial cues here. So examples here are concert venues or shopping, uh, shopping mall. And for these cues, people are more likely to use more fine-grained uh, perceptual or spatial details to help trigger remembering. So they're kind of using information at this more uh, fine-grained scale to think about uh, past personal experiences. OK, so we had these two cues. Um, and what we did is we actually used them in this autobiographical fluency task. So here we gave 35 young adults eight of these event theme cues and eight of these spatial cues. And we asked them to state out loud as many specific past personal experiences that they could think of as quickly as possible in a 90 second period. So just think of all memories that you could think of that you're reminded of when you see one of these cues. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if memory that was accessed uh, by these two cues differed in any way. And to do that, we actually looked at three variables. Um, so first, we looked at how easy it was for these participants to access a memory. And we did this by looking at the reaction time it took them to generate that first memory in each of those cue conditions. We then looked at the overall number of memories that people could come up with in that 90 second period for those theme versus spatial cues. And then finally, we actually had people say out loud all of the memories that they were coming up with. So we could actually look at the types of memories that people were generating when they were triggered by theme or spatial cues. So these are the three uh, factors that we looked at in this study. So first, when we look at reaction time uh, to generate that first memory, what we found was that people were significantly <coughs> faster to generate a memory when remembering was cued by a spatial cue compared to this, these thematic cues. So it's showing that with this more fine-grained uh, approach to remembering, people can kind of like z zoom in on a memory much faster. But what's interesting is when we look at the number of memories people came up with over that total 90-second fluency period, 
we actually see that people can generate more memories when, uh, when they're queued with this event theme queue compared to the, the spatial queues. So this is uh, suggesting that they can access a memory quicker with perceptual information, but they can access more, uh, more memories or have more of a broad access to their autobiographical knowledge with these event theme queues. So those are some really interesting differences, but what's also really interesting is the difference we found when we looked at those types of memories that were generated across the full fluency period. And what we did is we took those descriptions of the event and we used a scoring technique that actually classifies memories as either specific, extended events, or repeated events. So specific events are um, events that took place in a single time and place. Um, so this is an example of this would be if somebody said, uh, my birthday party in June. And most of the responses were specific memories because this is what we asked people to generate. But we also have these other two uh, memory descriptions um, that we also classified, these extended and repeated events. So an extended event would be something that, uh, an event that someone's describing that takes place over an extended period of time. So it's not necessarily uh, autobiographical memory, but it's something that kind of moves over time and space. So example would be a weekend trip to Toronto. And then we have repeated events. So these are events that occur you know, time and time again. So they are something that's a regular routine that you do in the same location, but let's say at multiple different times. So saying something like, I always go to Starbucks in the morning. So what's very interesting is when we look at the number of, or the percentage of the memories generated in these two Q conditions, what we find is far more um, extended events were generated to those event theme queues. So again, these are the, uh, those um, events that cross both space and time. And then for the spatial theme cues, much more of, the, of these were actually repeated events. So here, this is giving us another indication that there are these dissociable uh, processes that are supporting retrieval depending on how it's triggered. OK, so that's really nice behavioral evidence that there are these different forms of remembering. Um, but of course, we wanted to see how this related to the recruitment of the hippocampus. And specifically, we wanted to test if conceptual versus, let's say, more perceptually guided retrieval recruited the anterior and posterior hippocampus. So how would we do that? Well, we did a, an fMRI study. OK, so in this uh, fMRI study, what we did here is um, we put um, 16 young, healthy adults in an MRI scanner. And we gave them um, a series of category fluency tasks. So this is similar to that uh, task I just described. Um, but what it involves is people are given a category, and they're just asked to think of as many items that belong to that category as quickly as they can in a given time period. Um, so like that behavioral study, we gave them two different category types. So we gave them these autobiographical categories. And these ones are, um, are ones in which people have to generate items that are all relate together based on more conceptual or thematic information. So you're tapping into more of your autobiographical general knowledge to access these items. So we can think of this as accessing information more from a broader scale. So examples here would be names of friends, books I've read, and so forth. We also have what I'm going to call these spatial categories. Now for these categories, the items that people are generating relate together on a much more finer grain scale. So these items are ones that share a similar perceptual context. So uh, examples here would be things in a kitchen, living room uh, furniture, and so forth. So what we want to do is we want to contrast the, uh, the patterns of neural activity between these two category conditions to see if there's any difference. So first, um, this is the difference when we look at the whole brain patterns of activity uh, that differed between these two conditions. Um, so on this slide, you see in blue, uh, these are, those are the regions that were more active for the autobiographical conditions. And then in, in orange, those are the ones that are more active for the spatial conditions. So what you should notice is that for those autobiographical conditions, you see more activity along the midline uh, regions of the brain, so such as the pecunious and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So these are areas that we often see when people are uh, recalling autobiographical information. 
But the spatial categories, we see a little bit more lateral uh, activity in the posterior uh, parietal cortex, but also a lot of activity in the posterior aspects of the medial temporal lobe. But things uh, get a little bit more interesting when we uh, did a region of interest analysis and really focused in on the hippocampus. So, you know, this is, this is our darling. And uh, when we did that, what we see is that, you know, both of these categories are recruiting the hippocampus, um, but the spatial categories are more robustly recruiting posterior aspects of the hippocampus. So you see that in orange. And the autobiographical category, categories are more robustly activating anterior aspects of the, of the hippocampus. And this story or this uh, dissociation actually remains when we look at even more uh, closely at very specific segments in the hippocampus. So we looked at the tail, uh, the body, and the head of the hippocampus. And we did this by manually segmenting each of our participants' hippocampi. I feel like I've just said hippocampus like 17 times in like 30 seconds. Uh, so we um, segmented this brain region. And then we extracted the level of activity within the head, body, and tail. And we plotted that for um, both of the conditions. So this is the activity for the right hippocampus. But we see the same pattern for the left as well, but um, just for uh, you know, slide's sake, I only plotted the right up here. And what you should notice is that for those autobiographical categories, you see far more activity in the head of the hippocampus, but for the spatial categories, the activity is very much concentrated in the tail or those posterior aspects of the hippocampus. So the second experiment, I think, really shows that accessing information by more conceptual versus spatial or perceptual information results in distinct activity within the hippocampus. And, you know, we interpreted this uh, pattern as evidence that the anterior region really does support retrieving and relating items together around general knowledge or a conceptual node. And then the posterior aspects support relating and retrieving items together when that central node is more uh, perceptual or contextual. So those are really nice findings. And um, we actually looked at this in another neuroimaging studies because we wanted to see if we would find this dissociation um, in tasks other than category fluency. And we also wanted to see if, we could, if this dissociation would be apparent when we looked uh, at autobiographical uh, retrieval. So um, I'll kind of walk you through what I mean by that. And it'll become a bit more apparent when I talk about the analysis we did here. But in this neuroimaging study, we scanned 27 young adults. Um, and what we did here is we showed them uh, pictures of common everyday objects, so something like a teddy bear. And we asked them to retrieve three different types of information in three of these experimental conditions. So first, we had uh, this autobiographical condition. So for this one, people were asked to uh, use that cue and think of a past personal experience, so something that happened to them from their lives. So that's our autobiographical task. And then we have these two non-autobiographical conditions that really map onto our predicted distinctions within the hippocampus. So we have what I'm going to call the imagery task. So here people were asked to use that cue, and they were asked to think about what it, you know, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it's used for. So kind of access conceptual information about the pictured object. And then in the spatial task, people were asked to use a cue and imagine an environment or a context you might find that object, and then think about other objects that would be in that environment as well. So really engaging some of this fine-grained uh, spatial processing. So really our question here we wanted to see is, um, d with those two non-autobiographical tasks, are we going to see the dissociation within uh, the hippocampus or the medial temporal lobes more broadly? And how do they relate to activity that we see during this autobiographical remembering task? Now, a great way to answer a question like this, where you want to look at common and distinct patterns of brain activity, is to use uh, a multivariate uh, analysis uh, technique called partial least squares, or PLS. So I won't get into the nitty gritty of this, but uh, essentially what PLS does is it extracts signal changes in the brain that's related to changing task demands. So in this case, these are our uh, experimental conditions. And it does this um, by, it establishes this relationship between the matrix of, let's say, functional imaging data, and then you have the matrix of uh, your design data or your behavioral data. So again, this is, in our case, these experimental conditions. 
And it re-expresses that relationship as a set of latent variables. So these latent var variables, what we, can th what, they, what we can think of them uh, for the sake of this talk are, are pairs of patterns of neural activity. And with each of the latent variables that we get that are significant, we'll get these two sort of dissociable patterns of neural activity. And then each of our uh, conditions of interest, our experimental tasks, are going to be assigned a brain score. So this brain score will either be positive or negative. And what this brain score will tell us is which of these patterns associated with the latent variable that condition is uh, contributing to or that that condition maps onto. Uh, hopefully it'll make a bit more sense when I talk, when we walk, uh, when I walk you through some of those data. So those are the analysis, that's the analysis, uh, analysis that we use to look at this neuroimaging uh, data set. And when we um, used PLS, we got three significant latent variables. Um, so this, again, is telling us the common and distinct patterns of activity. Here we focused our, ana focused our analysis within the medial temporal lobes. And um, what you see up here, just to orient you, is on the left side of the screen. I still have to do that, right? Like, you know, that's, that's sad. Uh, but on the left side of the screen, what you see is plots of the brain scores related to each of the conditions. And then on the right side of the screen is the associated, um, associated patterns of brain activity for that latent variable. Okay, so for that first row, this is the first significant latent variable. What we see here is activity within the medial temporal lobe that is uh, distinctly recruited for the autobiographical condition. And that's shown there in the cool colors. So this is, uh, uh, you see this activity along the body of the hippocampus. This uh, latent variable also shows us a different, another pattern where we see distinct recruitment of a very anterior region of uh, the um, medial temporal lobe. So that's just up in orange there for that imagery task. So that task where people are recalling more conceptual information. Now that second latent variable, so that's the middle part, middle row. What we see now is common recruitment in the medial temporal lobe for the autobiographical task and that imagery task where people are recruiting that, uh, that conceptual information. So where are these two tasks uh, having overlap in uh, medial temporal lobe activity? And we see this here, again, this is in orange, in a very anterior region of the medial temporal lobe that includes the hippocampus. This latent variable also shows us activity that was specific for the spatial categories in posterior regions. But what's really interesting is that bottom latent variable that was also significant shows us regions of the medial temporal lobe that were common for autobiographical remembering and for recruiting these spatial processes. And here we see them within the posterior regions of the hippocampus. So what I really like about this is it shows us, again, you know, it shows us this, um, this distinction between the anterior and posterior hippocampus, um, you know, during these two forms of retrieval. But it actually shows us that that dissociation exists within uh, one task. So we see that dissociation when we're looking at autobiographical memory retrieval. So that's um, really great, uh, a really great pattern to uh, come out of these data. But I think um, you know something else that's interesting about these studies. You know, I'm like, what's interesting about these studies? Studies that I did. Um, but what's interesting is. What you're seeing here is you're seeing the involvement of the hippocampus in tasks that aren't inherently about remembering, right? So these are non-autobiographical tasks. And this kind of really goes against that, again, that traditional view that the hippocampus is this really exclusive region to remembering. And what I think it does is it really uh, asks um, important and interesting questions about, well, what are the precise functions of uh, hippocampal processes? So it's involved in memory, but maybe what else is it going to be involved in? And this brings um, us to the second point of the talk. And here I'm going to show you, uh, you know, spoiler alert, that the hippocampus is involved in uh, non-memory tasks. So it does hold these functions outside the domain of remembering. Okay, so at the beginning of the talk, I talked about um, how we know that the hip these hippocampal processes are really important for integrating information. So again, pulling those details from other areas of the cortex 
all together to form this sort of coherent past event in our minds when we're remembering. So that's really great, but there's this emerging idea that maybe these same processes that, this, that are supported by the hippocampus can also be used to integrate information into mental events or scenarios that aren't necessarily uh, about remembering. So they're not, ne they're not necessarily memories. So what I mean by this is that these same processes might be able to be recruited when we just need to construct mental events or scenarios. So there's actually some strong support for this that comes from a, a series of neuroimaging studies um, that have found a lot of overlap when people are rem remembering the past and when they're doing these other tasks that involve creating these mental uh, scenarios, such as imagining the future. So in a typical study of this sort, what will happen is uh, participants will be put into the scanner and they'll be asked to think about a past event. So think about a dinner you went to last month and then you'll be asked to imagine a future event. So tell me something that might happen to you next, you know, next month or a year from now. Now, what these studies do is um, they'll look at the brain activity that supports these two tasks. And when that analysis is done, what you see is there's really striking overlap. So this is, um, this is the areas that, are o that overlap between remembering the past and imagining the future. So you see there's a lot of similar activity between these two tasks. And you see that uh, quite strikingly within the medial temporal lobes and also within the hippocampus. So this really does uh, drive home this point that these processes that are supporting remembering are also very critical for tasks like planning for our future or even just imagining our future. And with this finding, it really opens up the door, I think, to uh, trying to figure out, well, what are the precise tasks that the hippocampus might be involved in? So if we see it's involved in these imagining tasks, well, can we sort of figure out exactly, you know, what it's doing uh, for these non-memory tasks? And actually, this is a question that I addressed in um, a line of research where we, um, I looked at um, how the hippocampus is involved in goal, more goal-oriented tasks and tasks that specifically might require constructing uh, mental events to help guide behavior. Um, so the specific task that I looked at was uh, social problem solving. So Larry David is a good mascot for how not to solve social problems. Um, and the reason that I chose to look at social problem solving here is because social problems are typically uh, open-ended scenarios. Um, so what I mean by this is these are tasks where there's multiple solution paths. There's really no guaranteed uh, outcome. and um, you don't really have a script or schema to follow to help you kind of reach an endpoint. So what this means is these open-ended tasks might benefit from uh, mental simulation or constructing, let's say, a hypothetical outcomes in your mind. And this would be something within the domain of the hippocampus. Okay, so how do we, how do we uh, uh, find some evidence for this idea? Well, we did this by testing social problem solving in groups of uh, individuals with damage or deterioration to the hippocampus. Um, so we'll get to the specific groups that we tested, but um, I just want to describe that the, the specific task that we used here, which was called the means and problem solving test. So this is a standardized test of social problem solving. It contains 10, it has 10 vignettes that all have a problem of a social nature. People are given a problem state and a solution, and they're just asked to describe in as much detail as possible uh, how to get from the problem state to that endpoint. So this is an example. Uh, Mr. C just moved to a new place, and he didn't know anyone. Mr. C wanted to have friends in his new neighborhood. So that's where the story, uh, the story or problem would start. And the story ends with Mr. C having many good friends and feeling at home in his neighborhood. So we get people to, to, to describe what they think the ideal solution path is when they're given uh, these scenarios. Now, with these descriptions, um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to first measure how effectively people could solve these problems. So we use this scoring technique uh, that measures effective problem solving. Um, and what it does is it takes these solutions and then it counts up the number of means or steps that are given in those, des those descriptions. And then these means are classified as either relevant, irrelevant, or a non-mean. 
So a relevant mean is a step that gets an individual closer to the goal that's in the problem. Um, an example here uh, from, let's say, that Mr. C vignette would say Mr. C would bake cookies for his neighbors. Irrelevant means are those that aren't related to the given outcome of the problem, so they're related to a whole other outcome. So saying something like Mr. C would move back to his neighborhood. And then a non-mean is a step that doesn't really describe an action, so this is something more like a miracle solution, such as saying Mr. C, you know, he just have friends uh, instantly because he's a nice guy. So these relevant means are really giving us a measure of effective problem solving. But in addition to effectiveness, we also wanted to get a measure of how people used episodic memory to solve these problems. So to do this, we used another scoring technique that segmented narrative descriptions, these narrative descriptions that we got, into pieces of information or details. And then these details are either classified as internal or external. So these internal details are ones that really rely on episodic memory processes. So we know this from a whole host of previous studies. And these are details that really describe uh, something that's specific to, uh, let's say, the solution or the events. So saying something like, Mr. C would bake peanut butter cookies, or he packaged the cookies in yellow tins. So they're giving these additional uh, episodic details. Um, these external details are ones that aren't specific to that event that's being described in the narrative. And these include uh, facts and general information. And they're thought to be more the domain of semantic memory. So saying something like, everybody likes cookies, or Mr. C is a shy person, would be uh, external. So really, those internal details are going to give us a measure of the use of episodic memory processes for this task. So what we did is we, we gave this task to, as I said, groups with um, uh, damage to their hippocampus. And the uh, participants that we included in the study were those with medial temporal lobe epilepsy that all had confirmed atrophy or uh, excision of their hippocampi. And they all had a selective loss or impairment of episodic memory um, that included uh, deficits in recollecting their past autobiographical experiences. So we tested this group of participants and then age and education matched controls. And when we compared their performance on the means and problem solving test between these two groups, what we first find is that those patients with medial temporal lobe epilepsy generated far fewer of these relevant means, but more of these irrelevant or no means compared to the healthy control participants. So this is, uh, suggests to us that hippocampal damage does result in less effective social problem solving. Now, when we look more closely at the content of those solution descriptions, so here we tallied up the number of those internal and external details, we see that patients uh, use fewer internal uh, details, but this, no, they weren't different in the number of those external details when they were constructing these solutions to the social problems. So not only are these patients generating less effective solutions or less effective solutions here, they're also less likely to use episodic memory processes to do so. So that's some really great evidence that you know these episodic memory uh, or episodic memory loss can actually bleed over and have consequences to social problem solving. Um, but we looked at this further by testing um, groups of uh, older and younger adults on the means and problem solving test. And the reason we did this is because as we age, we actually know there's a mild decline in episodic memory processes uh, when people are remembering autobiographical events. And this is, has been linked to hippocampal atrophy. So our question here is whether age-related changes in remembering the past does correspond to changes in effectively solving these social problems. OK, so when we uh, looked to answer that problem, we did this by comparing the performance on the means and problem solving test between the younger and the older adults. What we find is that while older adults generated the same number of means overall compared to the younger adults, um, significantly fewer of these means that the older adults generated were relevant. So this is suggesting that they are less effective at solving these problems. Um, and then when we look at the, num the, the number and types of details that these two age groups generated, what we see is that there is no difference in the number of external details, but older adults generated fewer of these internal or episodically uh, supported details compared to the younger adults. 
So again, we're seeing that uh, older adults here are less likely to use these hippocampally mediated processes to kind of come up with these solutions. Now what we also did here is with just the older adult group, we um, asked them to do this uh, other task. So we asked them to describe uh, five past personal autobiographical experiences. And then we took those descriptions and we scored them for the number of internal and external details that they used to remem remember these past events. And what we did was we then correlated the uh, number of internal details and external details to these scores from the means and problem solving test. And we see a very strong and positive relation between the number of internal details that are used to remember the past and the number of internal details to solve these problems, but also the number of relevant means or how effectively people can solve this problem, those problems that they were given. So, this is really a really uh, interesting finding because it suggests that you know there's some sort of underlying common mechanisms between remembering the past in detail and being able to effectively solve these problems. And what's important as well is we didn't see this relation at all when we looked at the number of external details from those past memories. So it's showing that this relation really is specific to uh, those internal details. So actually right now one of my grad students is doing a follow-up uh, study to uh, some of these findings to look uh, more specifically at uh, hippocampal involvement to these forms of problem solving. So we can see you know, where along the axis of the hippocampus um, there's recruitment to solve some of these problems. So um, you know, just invite me back next year and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what we have. Okay, so, so far I've showed you that the hippocampus is important for these different types of remembering. And I also showed you that it's important or uh, it can be recruited for different functions outside the domain of remembering that also involve mental, simu mental simulations. So in this last part of the talk, uh, I want to discuss um, some findings that suggest that how individuals approach remembering so we can think of this as one's remembering style um, is reflected in the processes we use uh, for memory. Okay, so there are a bunch of uh, studies. There's a lot of evidence um, and experiments that have looked at individual differences in memory. But these studies will typically use more laboratory-based measures of memory to establish how well somebody can remember. So these experiments uh, will use tasks like wordless learning or ask you to you know, study uh, some pictures and then uh, recall them later to see you know, how well uh, you can remember these specific, uh, these specific um, stimuli in the lab. And these studies have really uh, uncovered a lot of important, important information. Um, but what they really don't tell us is they don't really tell us that much about how people remember in the real world when we have to recall more complex autobiographical memories. And if we want to look at this, the way to do this is to uh, look at the strategies that people use when they're remembering in the real world. And we can think of these, this more as these trait-based memory differences. So how are you going to remember the past versus how are you going to remember the past? or this person. Um, so these are the differences that I'm going to be focusing on um, for the next uh, few slides. OK, so I've already kind of uh, gone through why we, th you know, some um, the ideas behind why we think these higher level trait differences might affect memory processes. Um, so this, again, is this idea that these episodic memory processes, so specifically those that uh, might be supported by the medial temporal lobes, can actually be flexibly recruited depending on what details, or we can think of them as what tools people are going to use to construct memories. Um, so just as an example, uh, you know, if I was going to um, approach remembering one way, uh, let's say I'm going to use a certain set of tools to build my past memories, and you approach remembering in another way, so you're going to, you have a different toolbox for how you remember the event, then that likely means that we're going to be using our neural processes and likely hippocampal networks in different ways to construct memories, even if it's the same event that, we're, that we are both remembering at that time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two studies that kind of follow up on this idea. 
Um, in this first study, I'm going to show you that individual differences in remembering style, so this is how one remembers in the real world, is actually reflected in connectivity patterns of the medial temporal lobes. So again, this is the region that houses the hippocampus. And then I'll talk about a second study where we looked at uh, how imagery ability differences also relate to the processes that we, we recruit when we remember event information. Okay, so in this first study, we really focused on these two ways uh, that people tend to remember. And these two ways actually relate to those components of autobiographical, autobiographical memory that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the talk. This is the semantic and episodic uh, remembering. Okay, so if someone is going to take um, an episodic remembering approach, so if this is the tendency that uh, you have for remembering, this means when you re remember a past event, you're going to recall really rich images, and you're going to recall that event in a lot of vivid detail. So if you're going to think about a trip to Paris you took you know, last summer, and you're recalling this beautiful dinner you had, being able to uh, you know, conjure up um, you know, the layout of the restaurant, uh, you can almost hear the music that was being played, and you know, can taste the cheese that you were eating that night, means you're taking this episodic remembering approach. But another approach is to take this semantic uh, remembering route to the past. And what this means is that when you remember past events, you might be able to remember them just as well, but now you remember them more by uh, bringing to mind associated facts, uh, the general gist of what happened, and you're re remembering this event more on an implicational level. So you're almost kind of remembering sort of the event steps that happened from that night. Okay, so we have these two different forms of uh, remembering approaches, or we can think of them as uh, memory personalities. And to get a measure of this, we used a questionnaire that asks people how they remember in the real world, which is called the Survey of the Autobiographical Memory, or the SAM. And what's really great about this questionnaire is it actually gives us different scores for episodic remembering and semantic remembering. So if someone scores high on this episodic remembering scale of the SAM, this means that they tend to remember using more contextual details and images. But if someone scores high on this semantic remembering uh, scale of the SAM, this means when you remember the past, you tend to do this, you know, thinking, thinking about it in terms of knowledge about yourself and about the events. So again, you're thinking about it more on this implicational level. So what we did is we actually recruited 66 participants who all had taken the SAM, and they had this, uh, we had this nice range of these, uh, these remembering abilities. Okay, so what we decided to do is we decided to see how these two remembering abilities related to patterns of medial temporal lobe connectivity at rest. So the reason that we wanted to look at resting state connectivity here instead of task-based connectivity is because we really wanted to try to establish these um, neural mechanisms or if there are different neural mechanisms that support these types of remembering without having the influence, let's say, of memory demands or any performance differences that we might get between individuals. So to do this, uh, the first thing we did was we established patterns of medial temporal lobe connectivity, and we did this both with an anatomical seed of the medial temporal lobe, and we also did it with a functional uh, medial temporal lobe seed that was based on a subsequent autobiographical memory task that all of our individuals, all of our participants uh, did. And then with that pattern, our next step was to contrast the relationship between episodic and semantic remembering scores to this pattern of connectivity. Okay, so when we did this analysis, what we found was actually very, very striking differences using uh, both when we used an anatomical and when we used a functional seed uh, between these two uh, memory personalities. Um, so what we found is that episodic remembering those scores uh, from the SAM were related more strongly to medial temporal lobe connections to very posterior regions of the brain. So this is shown in yellow and orange. So this includes regions in the precuneus, in the occipital cortex, and uh, the posterior parietal regions. 
But those semantic remembering scores were actually uh, uh, associated with stronger connections between the medial temporal lobe and more anterior regions of the brain, such as uh, the middle and inferior frontal gyrus. So this is really neat that we're seeing sort of these posterior and anterior medial temporal lobe networks that map onto episodic and semantic remembering. So I think broadly what's uh, nice about these results is they tell us that how a person just naturally remembers, so the approaches that you take to remembering does have some relation to neural processing or these uh, patterns of connectivity. And I think the specific patterns that we see from this, uh, from this uh, data set um, gives us some indications maybe about how these remembering styles might be supported by different processes. So um, if you remember from like last slide, those semantic remembering scores were associated with medial temporal lobe connections to these regions of the brain, uh, these anterior regions that are more important in uh, or are thought to support organization and conceptual retrieval, whereas those episodic remembering scores were associated with connections to areas of the brain that have been implicated in more perceptual processing and also imagery. So in fact, that last conclusion, that connection between episodic, um, episodic remembering and also imagery ability is something that really guided this last study that I'm going to talk about. So here what we wanted to do is we wanted to follow up on some of those findings from that study and a host of others in the literature that have linked episodic uh, memory to imagery. Um, by uh, conducting this experiment where we actually looked at how different forms of imagery might relate to the processes we use when we're recovering episodic information from events. So here we focus specifically on two forms of imagery um, that we established with um, the object spatial imagery questionnaire. Um, so here we looked at somebody's ability to engage semantic imagery processes, just so to think about spaces in your mind, versus object imagery ability. So how well do you think, can you imagine objects in your mind in vivid detail? So we determined, um, sorry, did I say semantic? Spatial, yes, thank you. Um, so we have spatial and object imagery. So what, what we did is we established these two forms of imagery in um, 37 participants using this questionnaire. So we have a measure of their inherent uh, spatial and object uh, imagery. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at how these forms of imagery ability related to the use of imagery processes when people are rem remembering event information. Now, to test this, what we did was we uh, paired a rec recognition memory test with a stimuli that's actually known to occupy imagery processes. So we can kind of think of this stimuli as a behavioral lesion. So it's called the dynamic visual noise, and this is a static version of it. But essentially what it is, it's a, it's a matrix of moving black and white dots. So when you present that to a, a, a participant, they'll, their imagery processes are going to be occupied so they can't use them for a, a concurrent task that they might be conducting. So with this stimuli, what we can actually um, try to answer is um, how does uh, removing the ability to use imagery processes affect the ability to remember event information? So this is the particular design that we use for this study. So we had this study phase in which uh, people were shown a series of uh, short 10 to 15 second videos that were designed to sort of mimic autobiographical events. So they were first shown an event title and then uh, they saw that video. And then after a delay we had this test phase where uh, participants were shown the title of uh, a video that they watched and then they heard um, through headphones a statement about that video. So something like, the woman was wearing a yellow skirt. And they were just asked to indicate whether the statement was uh, true or false. Now what's important is for half of these trials, we presented those uh, questions um, while the participants viewed that DVN, so while their imagery processes were occupied. And then in the other half, they uh, answered these questions while they were viewing uh, just a gray screen. So this is our control condition. 
So really what we wanted to um, look at is how uh, the DVN condition, so removing imagery processes, uh, impacted memory performance. So we looked at the difference between accuracy in the DVN condition to the control condition um, and uh, to assess that. And what's actually kind of wild is we actually don't see any difference at all when we look across all of our participants. So, you know, like GASP, that was, um, that was uh, you know, that could be potentially surprising. Um, but the story actually changes when we take into account these individual differences in imagery ability now. Um, so up here, what I have is the proportion of uh, correct responses in the control and DVN condition that's plotted against the object and the imagery ability scores of our participants. So what you see first off is there's no relation uh, between um, the impact of DVN on this task for the object imagery uh, scores, but a very strong and significant relation between spatial imagery ability and the impact of the DVN. So what this uh, study really shows us is that uh, when you uh, have your imagery processes occupied, this is going to disrupt your ability to recover uh, episodic details from these um, autobiographical-like events, but only for people who are high in spatial imagery. So it suggests that there's something special about uh, people who um, endorse uh, the, you know, this very high spatial imagery and how they use imagery processes to remember. Um, so that's the, you know, the specific findings that we can take away from the study. But I think there's, there is a bit of a broader message that comes, you know, that's kind of packaged nicely with some other results that are coming from the literature to suggest that you know, there really are these processing differences in how people remember autobiographical information. And it's something that we, you know, we should start to take into account when we look at these underlying cognitive mechanisms. OK, so I presented, um, I presented probably a lot of data to you uh, today. But um, you know, I hope I've convinced you, or at least gotten you to think about three things. Um, first, that there are different regions of the hippocampus um, that are recruited uh, differently depending on the way information is retrieved. Second, uh, I hope that I've showed you, uh, or gotten again, just gotten you to think about it, that maybe the hippocampus is involved in tasks that aren't inherently about memory. And maybe these hippocampal processes also serve important functions uh, in our daily life. And finally, um, I provided some evidence to suggest that, you know, how we recruit memory processes like those that are supported by the hippocampus, they might not be the same for all individuals. And, you know, these seem like three separate points, but I think we can uh, think of really uh, very, very cool avenues of future research when we kind of bring them all together. So we can, um, you know, ask whether individual differences in approaches to remembering are based on people recovering different types of information uh, and recruiting different aspects of the hippocampus. So that's actually um, something that we're looking at in my lab right now. Um, but you know, it's Friday. It's Friday. It's four o'clock on Friday. So that's that's a lot of a lot for you to remember. So if you uh, are only going to remember one thing. Maybe my name, that'd be nice. Um, but also, you know, I think we can boil, uh, boil this down to the fact that, you know, remembering really is this malleable act that depends on who is remembering what. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I just want to thank my um, collaborators and funding agencies.